Welcome back to Think Tech here at 11 o'clock on a given Friday morning. And we have Tim Apicella and Cynthia Sinclair. And we're doing Trump Week, which we do every Friday at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's, sort of, it's on my calendar. You know, it's a very important <laughs> item. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you, you Jay. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank yeah. you. Good morning. So, Tim, why don't you lead off? Uh, what's, what's the hot news this week on trying to understand the Trump administration? Okay, well, let's drink from the fire hose. Uh, for me, you know, obviously, the two topics, main topics, are the response to the national emergency from the House of Representatives, and then, of course, the Michael Cohen testimony. I think the uh, national emergency resolution that was passed, uh, 245 votes to 182, was very telling in a lot of ways. Number one, there's complete solidarity amongst the Democrats. There is no waxing or waning. But most importantly, there's 11 Republicans who, in my opinion, they're standing up for the Constitution of the United States, and they should be commended. Particularly, um, we have a gentleman by the name of Justin Amash from uh, Michigan, and he co-sponsored the resolution. He's Republican. And uh, one of the things he said was very, very, very poignant to his fellow Republicans. If your faithfulness to the Constitution depends on which party controls the White House, then you are not faithful to it. And good point. Here, here. I like that. Good point. Um, we had 11 Republicans take heed to that notice and that, those words and voted for the resolution. Mm. Now. Yes. Soon to the, the Senate. The other shoe, so to speak. The other <laughs> shoe. The, the Senate has 18 days from the passing, um, from when the, 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 the declaration was declared. They have 18 days That's to respond. right to a floor vote. That's correct. And uh, there is actually some noticeable opposition from the Senate for this national emergency, particularly those who are, are vehemently opposed to it is um, uh, Collins, Bartowski, um, Rand Paul. Um, we're going to have probably enough votes to send it on to the president's desk from the Senate. It's a long haul, isn't it? First, you have to get through the republicanism in the Senate. And then you have to get through the veto, and then it's going to have to come back uh, for an override. Um, none of those three steps are sure. No, they're not easy. Um, but we will say that right now, Senator uh, Tom Tellis from North Carolina, he's probably a strong vote for it in the Senate. We know Susan Collins will be from Maine. We're pretty sure Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. As far as the, um, the, the fourth vote that's required, it'll either be Corey uh, from Colorado or Joni Erst, um, or per, uh, perhaps La, Lamar, Alexander. Okay. What so, are your thoughts about this, Cynthia? Well, we know we it's going to be vetoed. Happen, or, well, whether it goes to the Senate or not, we it's know it's kind be of vetoed. immaterial because we know it's going to be vetoed. Okay. He has already said, I'm going to veto it. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then it's, it's where do we go from there? So yeah. it's like we already know where it's going to go here, but in the future is what I'm wondering about. We may potentially have a 67% override in both the House Wouldn't and the Senate. Nice. I mean, there is, I think there is enough concern from even our Republicans that we've accused of being, you know, blind to what's been going on and their self-interest of being reelected. But what if the Republicans stood for for so long, and that is a separation between the executive branch and Congress? I mean, they, and, and to some degree, they had some concerns, and rightly so, about the you know, executive powers that President Obama exercised in his administration. They, well, he, he wasn't getting any cooperation from Congress. That's why he did it. That's right. So, I mean, we're going to basically be in a gridlock in situation case, in those Trump days. Trump was getting total cooperation from the, yes. well, near total cooperation right. from the Senate. Right. This will be a test of the Senate. It will be a test of the Republican Party. I think they've already failed the test in my mind. You don't, it, think, you don't think they're going to override? Already, whether they do or not, in my mind, they have already failed the test. Every test down the road from the beginning. And I don't see how the Republican Party can possibly survive this unless they stand up now. And that's their own. And talk about the fact that they should have stood up before, especially after the kind of testimonies that we've had during the week this week. Yeah. But we've had, we've had glimmers of where the pub, Republican Party did stand up. Remember the sanctions. Oh, right. Okay. okay. That they, right. 98 to 2, you know, voted for. So right. we've had very small pockets of resistance 
to those, those are small pockets. Very this small is the pockets. Small. This and believe me, I am not defending the Republican senators. That's not what I'm here for. Uh, the bottom line is, though, we have seen some resistance, and this may be one of those issues that they do stand up for. I hope on, so. On, a, on an override of the veto, because the veto is coming. You're right. Yeah. I hope so. But okay, what happened with the gun bill that just went through? It failed, right? And that was Democrats kind of jumping on that one. And I don't know all the details of that one. I was hoping when it passed in the House, didn't it? I think so, and then it died in the Senate, right? Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, I shouldn't have brought it up because I don't know the details. I was hoping one of you guys might know the details. Well, well, that, that, but that's a point to make, though, Cynthia. A lot of these initiatives, uh, you know, you give credit to the House because they passed it, including some Republicans. <clears throat> I mean, I heard uh, stories on uh, NPR this morning. Uh, some fellow was talking about how, how, how well the, the, the House had done. And the, the Republicans in the House went along with it, and, and these were progressive, uh, you know, initiatives. Uh, but he didn't talk about the Senate, because in the Senate, you know, it often dies. Mm -hmm. um, so, we, you know, you can't get legislation without both, ha both houses. I'm right. sorry. Right. And so um, that's an incomplete, a huge incomplete. <clears throat> and, you know, and I was saying to myself, how come he doesn't talk about the Senate? Uh, so we, we can't talk about the House in a vacuum. No, of course It's not. the Congress. Right. It is my I'm prediction the Senate will pass the resolution. They'll have their four votes that... We, we need okay. four Republican votes to pass that and send it on to the president's desk. I predict here and now it will pass. Okay, and Cynthia, you're. Uh, I predict that he's optimistic. going to veto it, and yeah. then it's going to come right back, and yeah. then we have to work on getting enough people. Well, isn't think, it a, you think a it larger work? margin? Will we get that emergency, you know, you know, undone? I don't know. I I I don't know. I'm sorry. I I can't make predictions <laughs> for this administration uh, uh, anymore uh, uh, or the way uh, things are going uh, well, we could we be in a different job making a big big paycheck <laughs> we can accurately predict we're not getting that paycheck well, I think uh, the reason that you guys are you know reluctant to predict and commit in advance like that <laughs> uh, you know on a veto is that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow right we know what's going to happen today yeah this is a you know it's a, a what do you call it a, a reality show Right. Uh, and there's a, a surprise. All we know is that the first 20 articles in the, the major newspapers are all about him. Right. All we know is that the, is the television is all about him. And everybody is thinking about him, although a lot of people won't talk about him. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, uh, what I'm saying is um, it's hard to predict what is going to happen when you mm -hmm. can't predict all the, yeah. the factors and circumstances around it that drive those decisions. Yeah. Look, at, look for those senators that are up for re-election in 2020 that are in purple states or slightly blue states. Mm -hmm. You'll see them capitulate a lot, lot more than their counterparts that are in solid red states. Sure, absolutely, states. absolutely, absolutely agree. Oh, let's talk about Jared. Um, oh and Jared got a security clearance. I think it was top secret security clearance. You know, and, that, and that's all in the circumstance, in the context of Trump wants him to be, um, you know, a major player in foreign policy and everything that the White House does. Um, and he's, he's a son-in-law. Uh, we really haven't seen that kind of uh, nepotism before. And I wonder, you know, how, you know, this, this thing with the uh, intelligence agencies saying, Trump, don't do that. He's not qualified. He may, he may be working for the Russians, you know. Um, and uh, nevertheless, Trump uh, orders the intelligence agencies to give him this top secret clearance. Well, what are your thoughts about that? Well, partly they thought that one of the reasons he wasn't a good candidate for this security clearance was because of his family's financial ties all over the world, not just Russia. So the, you know, the skeptical way that they looked at him and the, one of the reasons why, or some of the reasons why, they did not want to give him that clearance was because of these things. These They're in debt by a lot to a lot of different countries. That puts him at risk to blackmail or, um, you know, favors. If you, you know, do this for us, well, yeah, he's very, very vulnerable. And they were very clear about that on top of the fact that he lied on his forms about Russian contacts. And then first he blamed it on his assistant, right? It, oh, it was their fault, right? It was, I didn't really mean and to he, do it. he lie in a storm? But then it didn't happen just once. Had it been just the assistant, okay, so you correct it once. He had to correct it like three times. Multiple times he had to correct his forms. 
So we know that both General Kelly and McGahn, the White House um, lawyer, wrote memos about the fact that Trump encouraged, well, pressured them to go ahead. So what is this all? Ordered I mean, he still has a security clearance. Yeah. He's right. still walking around. And, and he's in the Middle East right now, right? In the Middle East right now. So what does this mean in the larger context? Well, yeah, we, let's look at Donald Trump. First thing, I had no involvement with the clearance That was process. demonstrated oh, yeah. as a and lie. And the market team okay. Dad had zero to do with right, it. So, yeah. You know, it's like 1,523rd life for this, you know, right. administration. Right, so, you know, it's like, oh, another yeah. lie. You know, it's, it's no big deal, right? Because right. that's what he does. Except that some people, and I mean some people in the elevator that I meet and I ask them about this, uh, some people believe the lies. Right now, they don't, they don't, oh, yeah. they don't have cognition on that fact. I don't know what to believe, and, people say. So I don't know what to believe. So he gets away with the lies. Yes. Yes. All right, beyond that. Well, beyond that, let's look at the fact that why would um, General Kelly and uh, the McGann. White House, McGahn, right, has to write name. their own memos yeah. on this very topic to cover... Basically, a CYA in the future. Yes, because right. they knew this was a, a bad idea to let right. this gentleman get clearance, and he got it. Yeah, and so they did a CYA. What about the nepotism aspect of it? I mean, it's, it's kind of creepy well, to have your son-in-law working in such a high position. Well, right? Ivanka too; she has the clearance. Same thing, right? And the and Ivanka has said, "Dad did zero; had nothing to do with money or experience in government. Neither one of them." Right. Well, that's the biggest thing that they're talking about, and and I think is important too. Is right now he doesn't have full clearance, right? So there's some stuff he doesn't know, and he's out there talking with heads of state, talking with you know presidents and royalty and all these, and furthering our position on peace and whatnot, trying to you know Netanyahu. Okay, Tim, what do you think? Sorry. Let's look at history. When Richard Nixon left the administration and resigned, what did the legislature do to address many of these shortfalls of that administration? All sorts of new laws were enacted. And the two that come to my mind would be the nepotism issue that has to be uh, addressed in, in the form of new laws and also the emollients clause. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the fact that he's getting compensation and while he's being president and, and you know, all these and not segregating all his businesses oh, it's, while he's it's a president. It's not completely divested. It's all together, isn't it? It's all together. Right. So I, I think got to be right. in the Mueller report. I, I think what you're going right. to see when this administration is done and dusted, you are going to see an effort by the legislature to address many of these things that have cropped up in the last two years at least. We'll see. We've got to recover. Our democracy is in, in great danger here. Let's go to, uh, let's go to our, our very favorite uh, Michael Cohen and, and the testimony that he gave in public on Wednesday. Huge. At this point, Cynthia takes out her notes, and she's got seven pages. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a testimony. At least seven pages is appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But can I start with the thing that I think is the most important, and I was the most moved by, and that was Chairman Cummings' closing remarks, when he says, we're better than this, and he's been saying that for a long time. We are better than this, and we need to get back to normal. But mostly at the very end, when he, when he said that, when we are dancing with the angels, what will the question be? In 2019, what did we do to make sure we keep our democracy intact? Did we stand on the sidelines and say nothing? I think that's really important. And for all the flack that I get for being on this show, I'm like, I'm doing something. And I don't... You can go ahead and give me all the flack you want. And that, I swear, I started crying when he poignant. said that. It was very, that was very yeah. It was moving, yeah. Yes, it was. Uh, how about you? What, are you? what are your high points on the... Well, the high point was, in my mind, that the, you know, the comments that Roger Stone did make yes. a phone call with Donald Trump in the office about his connections to um, Assange and Wiki, WikiLeaks. Right. That is a huge point of this it testimony. Is. And I, I'm not sure people really grabbed onto it the way they should, because that's huge. Yeah, it shows he knew ahead of time. He so, knew beforehand. That's and then huge. There's another one. Right. My, my high point was, uh, I shouldn't say high point, my low point, <laughs> was where uh, Cohn actually said that he didn't think um, that in, in 2020, if Trump lost the election, oh, yeah. there would be a peaceful transition of power. That was big. What he was talking about, and there have been various commentaries about this since Wednesday, um, was a coup. 
Yeah. If you're talking about a coup, uh, violent possibly, <clears throat> where Trump stays in office no matter what. Well, that's uh, where Trump has alluded to that in the past. Well, we've had echoes of it. Uh, that's why the national emergency here. puts us at risk. Because well, it gives him extra power where he can manipulate things so that we don't have this election. Yeah, I'm going to so defer don't... the election. Yes. Or I'm going to defer the exactly. inauguration. Exactly. Right? You know, I'm going to somehow pull the rug out from under. I mean, yes. one of the interesting points that, that happened in 2016, as we, we went toward the election and the campaign, Trump was saying, if I win, it's an okay election. If she wins, it's rigged. It's rigged. It's rigged. Right. So I mean, he's going to do the same thing. That's what yes. I think. He will. He, he's he's, he's going to refuse to leave the White House. He's going to say it was a rigged election. It was all wrong. We're going to have to hash this out in some other way. In the meantime, I stay president. You know. <sighs> On the other hand, if he wins, he doesn't make any. To what degree is that, that incitement? Incitement well, for violence. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. and you know there is some federal laws that you know prohibit that. But to what degree is the president of the United States potentially going to incite for riot? Well, I what you're really saying, I think, is <laughs> what, what, to what degree, to what um, avenue would the president go down in order to, uh, you know, undo the election? Right. Okay, and, and one of them is it was rigged and start an investigation. <clears throat> Another is to find a way to declare a national emergency right. <clears throat> and, you know, incite a, a riot or a series of riots across the country, right. claim a national emergency. You, you see that Congress is mixed on this. Not necessarily going to stop him. Right. Okay. If it's a national emergency, he goes one step further and says, "Well, um, you know, it's a rigged election, uh, or it's not the right time." He says, "It's not the right time right. for me to step down. We need me to be here." Likewise, a war. He can incite. He can incite a war. Yeah. Uh, there's so many ways, you know, that he's leading up to that around the mm -hmm. world by, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing uh, uh, doing things that make people hostile and angry. Right. We have directly allies. And indirectly. He's making so yeah, nations, right. nations are enemies. closer to war now than they have been. Right. Uh, if he triggers a war around the time of the election, he could claim, gee whiz, we're in a national emergency by virtue of a war. And, you know, you can't change presidents while you're in a war. And it's, it's sort of similar to the domestic riot. Um, but, you know, right. there are lots of options yeah, for there's him. There's a lot of options. And if he's right. in bad faith, and we know that he's not capable of good faith, yeah. um, you know, then what, what you have here is the possibility of um, a coup. Yeah. Thoughts? I think he's going to. I think I've been afraid of that from day one. And I've been talking about it from day one, too. The national emergency is just one step closer to the martial law that I've been talking about all this time. And that's all he needs to do, and then yeah. he can stay Okay, well, that's happy news. Let me, bring up, let me bring a second point on this Cohen testimony because I think it was um, very, very uh, effective of this particular um, House representative to do. We heard the Republicans really didn't bring their, their best game to the committee hearing. They didn't do anything. They didn't. Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. They didn't, they they didn't bring too. their best game. They, <laughs> they didn't really do their homework. All they could do is try to discredit Michael Cohen and say that no matter what he says, it's... It's not credible, and he shouldn't even be here at testifying. Right. This was a mistake. That For eight hours, that's all we heard from the Republicans. Liar, liar, pants on fire, sorry. Yeah, the big poster. <laughs> the big poster behind. We one joke so, for today. We had a gentleman. It's ridiculous. Uh, Representative <laughs> Gerald Conley, Democrat for Virginia, who very, very carefully resurrected the ghost of Joseph Valachi. Now, Joseph Valachi was a mobster. He was a... Mafioso, Costa Nostra, back in the 30s, he was a murderer, he was, you name it, he was, you know, he was all these things. Right. He testified in 1963 before the House Committee. Uh, what about the Costa Nostra? Mm -hmm. They didn't know what the Costa Nostra was, so he went into detail about all the things the Costa Nostra, but he made this point. He was a liar. Had we not used liars and people f within the filtration <laughs> of, of the organization... How would we ever, ever get convictions via the RICO Act? Right. And the fact that you call him a liar but we can't rely on his testimony is a false argument. Right. Therefore, we're going to listen to him and we are going to follow up on his testimony. Sure. Whether, no, Repub great. whether you Republicans well, like it or not. Well, on credibility, you look and see whether the person is speaking against his own interest. Right. In this case, I think Cohen made it clear he's going to jail. He's admitted criminal activity. 
Um, you know, can't we get paid? He has no reason to lie. Not just no reason to lie, but no reason. He has plenty of reasons not to lie. In other words, he could have a higher sentence of what happened to Manafort mm -hmm. when he didn't stick to his plea agreement. He has to, he has to tell yeah. the truth. By the way, the term rat was used against Malachi <sighs> back in 63, <laughs> where President Trump labeled Cohen a, a rat. rat. Yeah. Now, if you're going to prison and you've now been labeled by the president and all your loyal people who may be in prison too, um, you've, you've labeled him a rat. That is, that is very serious when you're going to prison for a number of years. One well, well, of the points I'd like to make about that hearing, uh, and there's many points to make, but uh, was that some of the, uh, some of the, 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 the uh, representatives there, especially including Republican representatives, made, made speechifying. And they went on and on and on, yeah. grandstanding, right. and not, not asking uh, cogent right. questions, not even making cogent points, and wasting time. Uh, here's a valuable witness, a witness that could establish a roadmap for Mueller and the, and, and the Congress right. to find out what really went, went, went on. Instead, they're making speech and they're trying to criticize him and, and whatnot. I mean, it had nothing to do with see seeking the truth, really. Right. Not zero. Right. But... O o Alexandria Ocasio, she kicked butt. I loved her. She, she was... is to be complimented. Yes, yeah. she is. You know, she if, I, if I was worried about her youth and uh, you know her lack of experience before, Boy, not yeah. so much. Uh, she, I, I saw the, I saw the video of it. She was asking cogent questions. They were prosecutorial uh, follow up. Who do we talk to? Who can tell us? She was the... listening yep. to the answers. Yep. So she was a star. I agree. Beyond any of the others, as far as I'm concerned. I agree. She yeah. stood out for me, well, too. Well, and thanks to her questions, the name um, Weiselberg, the CFO for Trump Organization, came to light. Right. Now, he's been the CFO, the accountant for, you know, Trump Sr. for all these decades. Um, how did they finally get Capone? It wasn't on, you know, <laughs> all these heinous crimes. They got him on tax evasion. <laughs> And they got the right. accountant. So once you have the accountant, we're going to see the right. particular what Cohen testified to is the underinflation or the overinflation of his real estate assets. Underinstatement for tax purposes, overinstatement for bank loans and insurance purposes. Well, that was one of the you things he claimed, too. That was one of the things he claimed specifically, too, for a Deutsche Bank loan. Things were, so it's very specifically, so they're... They went so straight to the Deutsche Bank and, a, a trail and for are starting to follow, yeah. for the right. Congress to follow. Right. <clears throat> you know, I think it was very valuable testimony. You know, what, what I worry about, though, is that um, Trump has the power, and nobody seems to be arguing about this power, seems to be an absolute power to pardon and commute sentences. Manafort will be the beneficiary of that, right? Uh, probably, and maybe Weisselberg will, too. Uh, I know it'll be subject to great criticism, you know, but they they can hold back, get convicted, and then be excused. Mm -hmm. Yes, not from the Southern District. Not yet. Not York. from the state. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> Only from federal Thank you charges, that. but not true. state charges. The Southern District and uh, well, you don't mean the Southern District. You mean Manhattan. Manhattan. The Southern District is federal. Manhattan. Yes. So it's a federal sentence. Yes. You know, it could be commuted or pardoned. Right. But a state sentence right. cannot. <clears throat> so it's up to the states. And it's ironic they, that and they're it's moving, up to the states. And they're moving ahead rapidly on, on yeah. very parallel things that Mueller has been working on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not convinced that these uh, dangling pardons are going to serve anyone well. No, oh, and, and if he does that, you know, he's, he's going to be criticized uh, to beat the band. So, okay, so we, we step further. Well, one Everybody thing is saying, that I thought was really important at the Cohen trial, at the hearing, was when Mark Meadows brought that gal out and had her stand there, that black woman, had her come out and just stand there while he Horrible. talked about how he can't be a racist because, look, she works for him. Yeah. Oh, I was just like, was just my jaw hit the floor. I, and, then, and then this is the part, though, that really struck out to me, is when he's professing his innocence after those two other de Democratic uh, representatives kind of, lit into him about it and how terrible it was because it really was horrible that's like saying i have a black friend i'm not racist i have a black it's basically okay. the same thing as that let me go but on then to he the says, next point Cynthia. okay go ahead uh we only have a couple of minutes left here. oh okay oh gosh uh, we're so and that is you know where are we in terms of uh Mueller? where are we in terms of the possibility of impeachment there's been a okay. lot of talk on the media lately um you know everybody is assuming that Mueller's coming in soon 
but also Mueller is going to be um, a short report, a roadmap report, sort of like Cohen was, uh, rather than uh, you know an indictment per se. And he's going to, Mueller's going to leave it up to other authorities to actually proceed on the facts he finds, mm. which could be you know astounding, which I think will be astounding. Um, but then you know you get into the question of, and there's a lot of discussion about it about impeachment. And this morning on National Public Radio, there was a, a call in on, do you think Trump should be impeached? And I, I wasn't keeping notes on, you know, who said what, but my sense of it was maybe two-thirds of the people that called in, it's an open poll that way, you know, an informal, uh, said, yes, he should be impeached. There's good reason. We've got to do it now. Another third said, well, you know, the election in 2020 is so close, and, you know, we have so much work to do to get Congress to, you know, do progressive things. And it seems like Congress might do progressive things. So we should attend to that instead of an impeachment, which will suck all the oxygen. So <clears throat> I just wonder what your thoughts are about, A, the national mood, and B, uh, you know, if, if there is a move to impeach him in the House is where it would start, um, you know, what will happen? Cynthia? I think it's going to change rapidly over this next week or so when Cohen comes back, when we start getting the results of the investigations and the trails that the House has followed. Adam Schiff came out after the closed session and said it was very productive. It shed light on their core parts of their investigations. So I think in this next week or so, we're really going to well, see a lot of we changes. We have to follow that next, yes. next Friday. What about you, Tim? For the two-thirds, I think now is the time to impeach based on what the information is at this time, premature. It's just too premature. When the Mueller results come out, then let's start looking at it. And I think you will see, you will see the American public, and Republicans included, go, wow, this is more than what I really thought. Now, there will be that 35% that says, you know, Donald Trump can shoot someone on the middle of Fifth Avenue, and we won't do a thing about it. There might be that 35%. But you will see independents. You will see Republicans that do care about the Constitution, that are conservatives, and they do love their country. And I think they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna wake up. Yeah, that was the reason that most of those two-thirds gave. And right. we can't wait. The Constitution right. is being damaged right now. We right have now. to repair it. And repairing the Constitution, getting back to a constitutional democracy, is more important than any single initiative. Even health care. And okay, we don't we even know remiss. if the lower report's coming we out. We would be remiss we don't see it. if we <laughs> didn't mention very briefly uh, what happened in, um, in Vietnam. Uh, just cool. give me a, a one-line one reaction. Okay. I'm going to take his word for it. That's it. That I'm going to take him at his word. Oh, about the killing yeah, of Yeah, tell him yeah. that he's going to take him at his word. I'm not talking about, though. I'm, I'm talking oh. about the, 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 it was, a, a, you know, a nothing burger. It was a nothing burger. Nothing happened. They didn't do their homework. Yeah. Well, as, as I, I, think the, I think the idea is it's a, it's a tremendous naivete on the part of Trump to think that he can do personal diplomacy yeah, it's, without it's, using his the, staff. His, which his is self-inflated idea of himself that the power of his personality will win the day. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, let's go back to Ronald Reagan when he went to Iceland. He and Gorbachev, they thought their personalities were, were, were dazzling enough that it would get the agreement about nuclear you know, disarmament. And it didn't work. Okay. And this is no different. Okay, we have to follow that because right now the nothing burger, you know, rules the field. Cynthia, Cynthia Sinclair, Tim uh, Apicella, thank you so much for thank coming you, down. Jay. Thank you, Jerry. Next Friday, it's a date. You got it. Next Friday. All right. Aloha. Aloha. Trump Aloha. week. <laughs>